And July's What's Neat starts right now. The What's Neat Show is sponsored by Caboose, sharing our passion for trains since 1938. This is What's Neat for July 2019. I'm your host, Ken Patterson, and this week, this month, we've got a great show. First of all, I take you out into the yard and I show you how roots from bushes and various types of plant material make some of the most incredible scenery material for realism on our layouts. Michelle Kempema, on the road with Michelle Kay, she shares with us this beautiful museum, Gulliver's Gate, out in Times Square in New York. It's an absolutely amazing 50,000 square foot museum, 187 scale, airports, trains, five continents are represented with 25 different cities and a lot of buildings that you're very familiar with. They've even built the Panama Canal and it operates. It's an amazing layout to witness this month on What's Neat. Stephen M. Conroy shares with us some great drone footage of a Union Pacific business train in all of its glory, even including the power cars. It's fun to study this train, but also check out all the beautiful shades of green in the farmland surrounding the whole consist. Soundtracks, George Bogatuck and Daniel Coombs, both together explain to us consisting of our locomotive fleets. There's three types of consisting that they explain this month, simple consists, basic consisting, and advanced consisting. They do it all in 12 minutes and it's quite an education where I actually took notes during this one. So with that, that's the lineup for the show this month. I do want to thank Caboose out in Lakewood, Colorado for sponsoring the What's Neat show over at Model Railroad Hobbyist Magazine. When you're out in the Lakewood area, be sure to check it out. It's one of the biggest, most amazing train stores that I have ever seen. And so with that, let's continue on with the rest of this month's show. For this segment of What's Neat, we're gonna talk about scenery. Now I'm outside moving around some bushes out here in the yard, and there's one thing that you get off of bushes that's the most amazing modeling that we can do, and that's using the root structure from a bush. The root structure makes great armatures for sagebrush or smaller weed structures on the layout. But the best thing that I found using roots like this is when you're modeling a creek where the creek curves around a curve and it cuts into the earth, you always have tree roots hanging out of the side of the bank of the creek. And that's exactly what these roots are perfect for. It's a great modeling material, costs absolutely nothing to do. It's out in your yard to be had. So check it out, think about this, Next time you're doing yard work, using the roots from your bushes as a modeling device to make your scenery that much better. And that's his technique for model building on What's Neat. Hi, this is Michelle Kempema with What's Neat, and I am in New York City in Manhattan, and I'm here with Bill Woodward, and we are at Gulliver's Miniature World. This place is amazing, and it has an entire world in one building, much like Miniature Wonderland, like inspiration maybe, but very, very professionally done. And so, Bill, tell us your title and what you do here. Okay, so I'm the head of model making, and uh, I just recently got that position, but I've been a model maker here since 2017. So you've been open for, a, well, since 2017, so just a couple of years. Um, there's been a lot of change here, I think, over that time, too. But tell us the history of how all these different models came to be. Okay, so um, we're privately funded, and the idea of it, well, I should say the, the ball really got rolling in 2014 and 2015 okay. as far as uh, securing all the funds that would be needed and this location. Um, and then in 2016, all of the teams were found to build the models, and that was all happening in 2016. Okay. Um, and so, and it took roughly a year, a little, a little more, a little less in some cases, for all the models to get built. 
And then in the beginning of 2017, the models started arriving here on site okay. to, to be assembled. So, I mean, it's pretty amazing just that feat alone, having these massive models built in other countries yeah. and shipped here. Yeah. And that's an amazing short amount of time to build a layout. <laughs> Some take a lifetime. Ours took five years. Wow. So at the Colorado Model Road Museum, five years to build what we have. So that's a, now. Tell us about some of the countries they were in. Well, let's see. Well, I'll just go around yeah, to around all the models. Road. So uh, the first model that that you you go into is the airport. Okay. Now that was 100% designed and produced here by by okay. us. All right. Um, right in the in the back <laughs> in the shops in the back, which which I'll take you into later. Okay. Um, so uh, now. We then come into the Great Hall, which has three separate continents, basically. We've got Asia, Latin America, and, and the Middle East. So um, Asia was built in China, in okay. Beijing. Uh, Latin America was built by a family in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Okay. Of course, that family hired up to 50 people at, at various points to, to come in and, and help them out to build it. Okay. And the Middle East was built um, in, in Israel. Okay. Uh, so then we have Russia, uh, the model for Russia, that was built in St. Petersburg. Okay. Uh, Europe and the UK uh, was built by Italians. Okay. And then we've got the New England model was built in Massachusetts. And uh, the model for Manhattan was built in Brooklyn. Wow, it's it's a worldwide attraction built around the world, and these models are beautiful. Um, you said just mostly scratch built. Uh, <laughs> I, I would say so for sure, um, because they're they're, you know, they're representing unique things. Uh, yeah. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of the kits that you can buy. Um, are you know well obviously they're site specific but as <laughs> right. far as like the ones that you might buy here in the states I mean they're going to be representing like American things right. you know Americana yeah. and whatnot <laughs> so maybe we'll buy a kit but we'll we'll you know we'll bash it and and uh, or, or repaint it um, um, I'm, I was looking at the uh, Buenos Aires section, and there is the section where the houses are built on the houses, built on the houses, built on the houses, and they just keep going up the hillside. There's no kit for that. No. <laughs> so that was really neat. There's so many working parts here. Uh, so let's talk about the behind the scenes stuff underneath it. <laughs> well, uh, so actually, um, even though I'm the head of model making now, I started out as a model maker and then after a few months they promoted me to supervisor of maintenance. So I ended up spending a lot of my time on my hands and knees underneath the models. So all of the models, um, the, the, the teams that built the models were required to um, you know, to have access so we can crawl under them, uh, we can go behind them and I'll show that to you also. Okay. Uh, and we have hatches we can come up in the middle of the model. Uh, for you know yeah. fixing and maintenance and adding things <laughs> so there's you know there's a lot of things going on uh, that the public doesn't see and sometimes we end up having to go into the models during opening hours too and they love that they love to see us working <laughs> in the models yeah I got to crawl underneath one <laughs> and oh, right. come up yes. inside yes. under the volcano, the volcano in <laughs> that was really neat access right. is important every modeler knows if you don't create access you have a big problem and <laughs> um, you use real water here uh, so one of that's the models, big. <laughs> one of the models has has real water. That's where I end up spending most of my time is yeah. is, is, is just making sure that it that it's operating. Um, the uh, probably the most prominent feature in that is a functioning Panama Canal. So we have two locks, and yeah. we have two boats that that you know, go around <laughs> all day long, seven days a week. So it's a real challenge. It's um yeah. it's a feat of engineering to be honest. So the the airport model has a tremendous amount of engineering in it and, and that Latin America model, for sure. Yeah, um, when we were down underneath, I got to see basically a turntable for a boat. <laughs> the ship goes in and literally a turntable in the water turns it. It was, right. that's amazing technology. Uh, there's Digitracks underneath the railroads. Uh, I did notice that under there. A lot of Arduinos, a lot of uh, programming. The, uh, the camera person holding the camera today is actually <laughs> an electrical engineer who, yes. <laughs> who specializes in micro uh, mechanics so uh, it's super intense underneath this well, place you actually bring up another <laughs> issue uh, because the models were built 
by teams in other countries, there was the issue of standardization. So, oh, yeah. all right. I mean, they were given certain guidelines, of course. It, it, everything had to be HO scale. Okay. Uh, but outside of that, I mean, there are a lot of variations <laughs> as far as wiring and the control systems. Uh, the um, the Italians used Panasonic uh, PLCs uh, yeah. to to control their animations. Uh, other models are using the Arduinos. Um, so <laughs> it, it's you know it's been a learning process, and, yeah. and we're slowly switching some things out just to, to make everything standard. A little more standard. Otherwise, you have to be a master of all of it. <laughs> um, tell me about the 3D printing that goes on here. Okay. Well. <laughs> yes. Uh, one of the most common questions we get asked is, and it's uh, for the people asking this question, it's almost a rhetorical question for them because they're sure they know the answer right away, which is, the question is, it, everything's 3D printed, right? <laughs> and the, the answer is actually a, a very small fraction mm -hmm. of what you see is 3D printed. Um, and when I tell them that, they look at me, well, for, it's not the answer that, that they wanted right. uh, or, or expected. Um, you know, it, we have a really amazing 3D printer. It's actually a carbon printer, so the level of detail is, is incredible. Um, but we, we, we're very selective with how, you know, how we um, apply it. And um, I mean, I can certainly, you know, later I'll show you some, some of the examples. I'll get some B-roll of this. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, yeah. de I'll definitely show you some of, the, some of the things we've used it for. I, I would love to have a special exhibit where we, we you know we do a layout and and one of the you know something small and it will be 3D printed right, right. and and then we'll we'll say to some <laughs> to a guest can can you you know can you pick out the thing item. that's 3D printed and you know and <laughs> yeah. it, again it'll be this small little part of the model so yeah you know, most, I think I think a lot of people think that you can just 3D print anything and just throw it out there well, first of all <laughs> remember it, yeah well behind us is your control center um, I was I was told earlier how this works everything in the building here actually is can, you can see it here pretty much I mean we can monitor uh, the models are all turned on and off um, through you know software yeah and all ac accessible here I mean obviously there are a lot of things that we still have to you know go under the models to, yeah. to do and then quite a few things in the Latin America model uh, have to be done underneath that model but uh, yeah, I mean, definitely, uh, I, I've been learning that myself. Um, Krishna, of course, is the expert. That's, that's what, you know, she's designed. She's a the lot camera of woman. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, I'm just so impressed with the detail. You keep it clean. It looks fabulous. There's so much maintenance. Uh, modelers can appreciate that. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Well, so basically, <laughs> um, you know, we we have a, a small crew, essentially, and. So we spend uh, a portion of our day, a small portion of our day, maintaining. Um, we come in at least an hour early in the morning. And uh, so each model maker, um, we have four model makers, and each okay. one is assigned a, a room, essentially, okay. uh -huh. um, a set of models. And they, they just take care of that model, mostly just doing light cleaning you know, around the front of the model in the morning. Okay. But that's important because they, they get to know the model really well. And if something's out of place or missing, you know, they absolutely will, will know that. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just like people take care of their home layouts, <laughs> you've got to maintain it. Um, at the Colorado Model Road Museum, we do that too. We have a crew that comes in. Okay. And they, yeah, same thing. Maintenance is huge. I mean, um, I'm told that Minnesota Wonderland <laughs> has a huge clean, just clean I bet crew. they, they do. Just, I don't know if that's true or not. I probably shouldn't even say that. But, you know, I bet they we're do. We're a little jealous. They have like you know, maybe a dozen people who, that's, that's just what they do is they clean. Yeah, yeah but you know, I mean, they're, they're the number one tourist attraction in Germany. I want to say this though. So this is Miniature Wonderland for America. Um, it's in this building, it's here, and if you're in New York City, you need to come see this. Uh, Absolutely. Even if you're a prototype modeler, and their trains might not be extremely prototype yet, <laughs> but there is amazing detail in every scene in this building. The winter 
the Russian winter area. Um, modeling snow is not easy. Um, there's there's so many details like that that are it's hard. An yeah. It's an art yeah. in modeling to, to capture that. And there's so much movement going on here too. Uh, movement everywhere. There's a huge faller car system here <laughs> everywhere. Yep. Uh, we have just a little bit of that on our layout. So that's, and it's detailed. Ours is very complicated. I cannot imagine well, this is her job <laughs> to maintain those running on all sure. the layouts. Yeah. yeah. So future, what's your future look like here? What, do you, what are your plans? You, what are you building next? Well, I mean, we're <laughs> always adding things yeah. in, into the models. Um, uh, so for example, you know, uh, definitely go back and get some footage of uh, how we're revising Berlin. Okay. Um, yeah. And um, and it, you know that's a whole team effort. You know we've got model making going on there. Some some you know structural things happening and engineering, right. um, lighting of course. Uh, we added a new an uh, actually yeah a new animation okay. uh, into that also. So that's ongoing. And we have uh, two model makers in in the back who are hand painting. In scale, in, obviously in scale, the graffiti right. that was on the Berlin Wall. You know, oh, the exact graffiti yeah. on the yes, wall. Yes, yes. That's, that's I awesome. I mean, I just stand that's there awesome. like, you know, just <laughs> gawking at that. It's amazing. And yeah. so you can actually see that going on uh, in, in the back okay. right now. Um, you know, we've got a lot of floor space here yeah. and we can have a lot more models. Uh, a lot of them will probably be freestanding which is right. perfectly good. So uh -huh. a lot of the models we have now, with the exception of the Latin America model and the airport model, you know, they're, they're up against the wall or, you yeah. know, so, um, you know, that's, that's something that definitely I'd, I'd like to see. Uh, we uh, want to start um, building Africa. So we have a piece of Africa now, and okay. we've been in the design stage of that for a while. And um, hopefully that will move into the next stage soon. And that's going to be really spectacular. And oh, neat. we'll be doing yeah. that, you know, we hope to do that ourselves. Um, yeah, and so I'd like to get some more special exhibits in here too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I imagine modeling the jungle is not easy. <laughs> no, but you know, that, that, that's yeah. what's going to make it even more impressive. It yeah. will, yeah, you'll tackle it. Right. Um, well, thanks for your time okay. today. Um, all I can say is I was blown away when I walked in here. Uh, it's very alive. It's uh, an experience to see all these different places around the world. And the model making is fabulous. Just the buildings, every single building, the detail on each and every building. I don't suppose you have a number of buildings. Do you know how many you have? Thousands and thousands of buildings yeah, here. For you know, at, at least. <laughs> for at least. sure. Yeah. yeah, and maybe you could count your trees someday too. Well, I'm just kidding. <laughs> It's, it's a project, yeah, maybe, for, maybe for a volunteer. Um, but I mean, we have different, you know, also a variety of scenery too. You know, we have yeah. you know, urban centers and, and then rural areas. And a know. desert scene yeah, yeah, and sure. a winter scene Absolutely. and you have yeah. everything. Yeah. And a Loch Ness Monster. I found the Loch Ness Monster too. Right. Right. And, and it's interactive. Uh, you get a key when you come here. I should have had it in my hand. Uh, but you get a key and it does a lot of different um, active things. So instead of just push button, you actually are putting a key in and turning a lock. It's really neat. I, I really like that concept. I thought that was neat. So open every day, right? Yep. Let's talk about how to visit here. So, <laughs> so. Ten, right now, 10 to 8. Okay. Um, seven days a week. Yeah. So we know we, we certainly, we, we uh, want that tourist yeah. uh, business. Yeah, so you have to have New York but hours. But we want, we want uh, <laughs> locals too, you yeah. know, so we, everyone, everyone should come, all ages, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's nice to have an attraction for rail fans in Times Square, <laughs> sure. you know, and so this is definitely a place if you come to New York City, make sure you come here. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so nice much. Nice to meet you today.
Hey everyone, it's me, Daniel Coombs from What's Neat This Week podcast, and I got next to me... George Bogatuk from Soundtracks. And today, George is actually going to educate me on how to consist and advance consist the locomotive. So George, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Daniel. Now, one of the things that, that as a model railroader, I really enjoy is operation and running multiple locomotives. Well, with DCC, you can do that, and I think... Over the years, it's one of those concepts that never really got properly explained on what's going on behind the scenes to help make sure that we all run our locomotives the way we want to. We're spending a lot of time and money putting these sound and extra lights in all these locomotives to make sure they look as realistic as they, and sound as realistic as they look. Right. And so we want to make sure these bring these to life. But with the different types of consisting, there's certain shortcuts that you either have to make or certain sacrifices you have to do. And so what I want to do is kind of get out the information on what's going on, the different types of consists and how to set it up so you can get the most out of your locomotive. Okay. So first off, let's talk about the three different types of consisting and how they work. The first one is what's called a simple consist. And a simple consist takes our two locomotives and we run them elephant style. They're all set to the same address. So when I grab my throttle here and I grab, well, for argument's sake, say address three, the Ken Patterson method, yep. is we'll grab address three. When I move those locomotives forward, they're all gonna move forward. They're all gonna move at the same speed step. But right. what happens when I blow the horn? They're all going to blow the horn. Mm -hmm. They're all going to ring the bell. And you're all going to have that annoying echo. And you have that annoying echo. And the other side of it is when I turn on the lights, guess what? All the lights come on on every unit. In the real world, they don't have that. They nope. don't turn on the trailing unit's headlights. And so a simple consist, how do we fix that? We take the volume levels of the horn and bell on our trailing unit and set it to zero so it doesn't make that sound. Okay. We, we say, well, we've got the headlight on there, so I'll just live with it. And it's it, like I said, you've got all these eff efforts and, and put into the realistic operation, but now you're shortcoming because that's an easy way to do it. It's down and dirty. Yes. Your command station sends out one command to your train. Yes, it's easy and it's transferable. So it's really good. But then what happens if I want to run this second unit by itself? I have to go back and set those volumes for the horn and bell back to whatever volume level I want. Right. And so therefore I'm changing CVs back and forth every time I take it in and out of a consist. So it becomes cumbersome, okay? The second type of consisting is what's called a basic consist. And a basic consist uses the command station to determine which locomotives are in the consist. And the command is basically coming out as locomotive 5807, move forward, speed step 10, turn on F0, turn on F1, turn on F4. The command to the second unit is 8248. We'll go ahead and flip the direction here. Okay. And we'll say the command to the second unit now is going to be 8248, move reverse, speed step 10. Now, you didn't hear me say any function commands, did you? No, nope, I didn't. And not. that's because the... Oh, there we go. That's because when we're doing the basic style consist, all of the commands are sent to the lead unit. Okay. This, command, this type of consisting was developed when all we had were motor decoders. And so the only thing we had to care about were lights. Right. And so what happens is, is that if we send the light commands to the lead unit, the second unit is just a motor control, so it doesn't matter. And that's why that works that way. Now, the problem with this is, let's say, for example, we go to a club setting okay. and we have four or five people running three to four locomotive consists, well, that's 20, 25 commands that are being sent through the command station. Just about. And those are the active locomotives. Right. Those, not, those don't count the ones that are sitting still. And so they're still getting a DCC command. They're still sitting, even the command is locomotive 5807, no speed, no functions. It's still a command. We went to a club uh, somewhere in the United States, and I won't disclose where, but we pressed the horn button. It took three seconds for that horn to blow. Hmm. And that's because they had so much DCC traffic because they were using this basic style consist. Right. And so it results in delays. The other problem is, let's say I come over to your place to run trains. Okay. I have to build this consist in your command station now too. If I leave, it's stuck in your command station unless I clear it. And that's assuming it's properly cleared. And so because of that, it's cumbersome and I sacrifice because if I use, let's say for example, my brakes on my trailing units, uh, or if I use my brakes, I hit the F11, my lead locomotive gets the command, so it comes to a stop. The trailing unit never gets that command, so it just sits there and keeps pushing that locomotive down the track exactly. because the trailing unit yep. never gets the function command. Mm -hmm. 
So it's not very good, it's not very realistic. Can you get it to work pretty easy? Yeah, everybody can understand, okay, I'll select this locomotive and add it to the consist. It's pretty easy to understand. But we're shortchanging ourselves. Again, we're spending all this money and time on these sound decoders and lights, and we want to make sure it looks realistic. Right. So the best way to, solu to solve this, and it's universal with every DCC system, is what's called an advanced consist. An advanced consist uses the memory of the decoder because the decoder is smart. It is very intelligent once it gets that command. So we're telling the decoder that you're in a consist. And then the best part is, is we tell the decoder which functions to respond to when it's in a consist. So this is where we tell our lead locomotive to turn on the headlight, turn on the bell, blow the horn. Uh, and we tell our trailing unit and the lead unit both to turn on the brakes. And what really is cool about it is that now we can take any number of locomotives and we can build this consist using an advanced consist. Okay. And I take it to your place, I put it on the track, and it's going to run exactly the same way. Right. And your DCC system is no smarter. That it doesn't have any idea what my locomotive addresses are because I've built this alias in an advanced consist. Okay. So... Understanding how this works, the best part is, is our command station, again, sends one command, and my decoder intelligently interprets how to do all of that, okay? So let's quickly review. We've got the simple, everything's set to the same address. We're changing CVs. Patterson way. The Patterson way. <laughs> we have uh, the basic system, or the basic consist, which uses memory space, and you also don't get function commands to any of your trailing units. Right. The other way is advanced consisting. Now, advanced consisting to set it up, yes, it is setting a couple of CVs. But remember, in the simple consist, we're doing that anyway. So now, what we're going to do is we're going to go in, and our consist address is stored in CV19. This is a number between 1 and 127. It's basically a secondary address that the decoder says, ah, oh, I'm part of a consist. This can be the lead two numbers of the first unit, the second two numbers of the first unit, it can be a club member ID number, it can be a train number, whatever the case is, you set that in CV19 when it's facing forward. Right. If the locomotive is facing reverse, you add 128, and that tells the decoder you're part of that consist, but you're actually moving in reverse. So when we do this, I'm building this consist, this will be consist number 20. So in this lead unit, I'm going to set address or CV19 to a value of 20. On this second unit, I'm going to set CV19 to a value of 148. That's 20 plus 128, and that 128, again, tells the decoder you're facing rearward. So when you get a forward command, you're actually going to move in reverse. With me so far? Makes sense? It's making sense. So the second part of this is then we tell the decoder in CVs 21, 22, and then for the higher functions, uh, 13 through 28 uses uh, CV246, I'm sorry, 245 and 246. Okay. And we tell the decoder each of those functions we want it to respond to. So we can tell this locomotive, you're the lead unit, so you're going to respond to the horn, the bell, the headlight, and we'll say the brakes. Okay. Okay. The trailing unit is not going to blow the horn, it's not going to ring the bell, it's not going to turn on the headlight, but it is going to respond to the brakes. So by setting those CVs, we tell the decoders how to respond. So now, just to kind of illustrate this for you and really show how this comes to life, I've got these two locomotives already set up in an advanced consist. Okay. And right now, they're consisted at address 20. So the first thing we need to do is we need to start it up. Well, on the Tsunami 2, F5 is my RPM plus or my startup sequence. So when I press F5, you're going to hear both of these locomotives start up because I've told these decoders to respond to the F5 command. So as they start up, we'll get them going. So now, let's say we're about to run our train. We have to do a few things. So first, we have to turn on the headlight, which I believe is on. Uh, not yet. There okay. we go. So now we have our headlight on. Now we're going to turn on ditch lights, right? the ditch lights. Okay. And, now we're, and we're also going to turn on our number boards. We're going to turn on our truck lights. And if you notice, all the step lights are on. But if you look closely, you'll notice that the trailing unit also has the step lights on. And the reason is, is because those are courtesy lights for the crew. The lead locomotive is going to be the only one with the number boards and the truck lights, so that right. the, or the ground lights, whatever you want to call them. And the trailing unit here is going to have all the courtesy lights, so the crew can, when they walk from locomotive to locomotive, they can see where they're going. They can see where they're going. And so I've set that up so that my decoders will respond. 
Now when I send a, a moving forward command, you're going to see that the two locomotives are running together in tandem. Okay. And this one's running in reverse, and that's because I've told it you're facing reverse. Now when I set the brakes using F11, you're going to see that they both come to a stop. Right. I can change direction, and I'm going to go ahead and crank the throttle up here a little bit. We'll release our brakes, and you can see that those two locomotives are working together as if they are a single locomotive. Cut the throttle and set the brakes. I may have gone a little far there. But you can see how those two locomotives are working together, and that's the benefit of an advanced consist. Okay. Now, when I want to take this locomotive out of a consist, we're going to uncouple them really quickly here. I'm going to take this lead, this trailing locomotive, number 8248, and using mainline programming, whoops, I'm going to take it out by setting CV19 to zero. And 19 being your address, now it's disabled to say you're out of the consist. Absolutely. And the locomotive is on its own. Correct. So this locomotive is now independent. So now, when I start to run it, you see that the locomotive runs on its own. And look, I can have full control of the locomotive. Okay because I've told it now it's no longer part of a consist. And so what happens is when CV19 is set to zero, the decoder doesn't know or care what's in CV21 and 22 and right. 245 and 246 because they're not being referenced anymore. So to take it out of a consist, you just simply set CV19 to zero. This is fantastic for helper service because once you get to the top of the grade, you just take the trailing unit or the pusher, set CV19 to zero, pull it away. And it's now its own locomotive and the rest of the train goes on its own way. So this gives you that extra element of realism while still maintaining the operability and all use of all the sounds throughout the entire train. And this can be one unit, it can be 15 units, you can decide how you want to do it. And here's one of the best parts. If we want to do distributed power, we still set it up the same way. We just put a train in between them right. because it's still receiving the DCC mm -hmm. signal. So. That really gives you the extra element. And my, my goal here is to kind of show you how to, you know, what, what you can do with it. Right. And so with all of this, at soundtracks.com, we have our user's guide and it will explain and show the CVs how they work so that you can go through and try this out. The great thing is, is you can't break the CVs or you cannot break the soundtracks decoders by changing CVs. That's something that we do to make sure that you can't do it. So you can't set it to the wrong value and break it. So. Use that confidence, try it out, learn it, figure out how it works, and you, suddenly you'll have that aha moment. And once you do, you're gonna realize how much better your trains can run because now we're running these locomotives as if they're real locomotives. Right. And that's the goal of ultimately of what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So I hope I've showed some yeah, light on this for you. You know what, you. you've educated me and uh, this is gonna be a backup in case my Jamrai decides it wants to poop out. <laughs> then guess what? I got my command station that I go to and do the simple program on my programming track and mm -hmm. I'm set to go. Awesome. Well, thanks for that. I appreciate, appreciate it, George. It. Yeah, no problem. You Always have educated glad. me a lot. And I know for those of you who watch me on What's Neat, know that I'm a DCC guru. But again, I like to thank George for educating me a little bit on the CV changes. And I guess this wraps up this DCC segment for What's Neat. All of the model railroad products seen in this episode of What's Neat are available through Caboose in Lakewood, Colorado, or order online at mycaboose.com.